Alex asked me to talk a little bit about my own current research, which is in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and in particular um, in applying those to visual situation recognition. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's very much work in progress, so uh, you won't see the end of this today, but uh, hopefully you'll get a general idea of what I'm up to. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. So in 1966, Marvin Minsky, you probably all know who he is, uh, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, asked his undergraduate student, uh, Jerry Sussman, to spend the summer linking a camera to a computer and getting the computer to describe what it saw. <laughs> okay, so this was a good undergraduate summer project. <laughs> okay, so 50 years later, um, Minsky realized that we'd learned a lesson, which was that easy things are hard. <laughs> computer, so vision, right, look, describing what you see in a picture um, is a very easy thing. Any, you know, two-year-old who can talk can do that very easily, but it turns out to be very difficult for computers. So, um, more recently, within the last 10 years or so, um, Artificial intelligence, and in particular computer vision, has taken a big leap forward. There's been a lot of progress due to these things called deep neural networks. This is a particular uh, network called a convolutional network um, that will recognize uh, objects, like a number in an image, by um, extracting a lot of features over many layers, uh, uh, sort of inspired very roughly by the visual cortex. And then take those features and classify them as being one of some number of possible objects like the digits zero through nine in this example. Okay, and the, these kinds of neural networks have been around for a long time, but more recently they've um, had the advantage of very massive amounts of data to be trained on and uh, innovations in, that make them faster to train by using parallel computing ideas. So that's shown a, that kind of very almost brute force approach has seen a lot of um, success on object recognition in images. So this is just a very small array of images from the so-called ImageNet data set, uh, which is a huge data set of, of millions of images uh, of particular objects and uh, neural networks of the kind I just showed you have been quite successful, although not yet at human level, uh, in recognizing what kind of object is in a, a particular image. Okay, so that's, that's really uh, been quite impressive. But one thing that they can't do yet is something that is really at the core of human level vision, which is recognizing not individual objects, but situations, where a situation is a collection of objects in an image, say, that have some stereotypical relationship to each other. So here's my uh, situation recognition task, which is, I think any two-year-old could tell you that this is a dog walking situation, okay? We have a person with a dog connected to a leash, very simple. Uh, kind of a configuration. And so a challenge would be to get a computer program, which might be good at recognizing dogs in images or might be good at recognizing people, to actually recognize what humans might characterize as a dog walking situation. And many other situations, so this is a, just an example of one of any infinite number of situations that people potentially could recognize after very little training. So, um, that's something that computers can't yet do, and that's really the goal of my own research, is to try and take low-level visual systems that can recognize simple features like oriented edges, combine those into simple shapes and textures, and do object classification. This is roughly what these deep neural networks do. And I'd like to make a bridge between what we might call high-level perception, or this situation recognition, in which we have analogy making, which I'll talk about in detail in a little while, which is able to recognize 
that one situation is analogous to another situation, and thus get to this ephemeral idea that humans call meaning. The fact that these images of dog walking situations mean something to us. We understand them. How could we get computers to have that kind of understanding? So that's the question that uh, my, my research is aiming towards. People have called this the semantic gap. So this is the idea that computers can do this kind of thing, but in a very um, strong sense, they do not yet have this notion of meaning, this ability to apply their uh, recognition ca uh, capabilities in a very general way, the way humans can, and to actually use the, them in some way that shows that they understand the meaning. Uh, one, one example of this semantic gap is the fact that people have uh, seen that if you can train one of these uh, deep neural networks to recognize, say, a cars, and they do very well, you can f actually create, sneakily create what people call adversarial images, which are images in which you change a couple of pixels in such a way that a human couldn't even tell the difference. It still looks like a car, but the network now thinks it's an ostrich. <laughs> so people have figured out ways to find these adversarial images, which really show that the networks aren't quite getting it in the same way that we humans do. Okay, so that's the goal. And so the goal is to integrate these deep neural networks with their great ability to extract features um, with a system, a, a set of systems that I've worked on um, in collaboration with Hofstadter and his group called the Active Symbol Architecture for High Level Perception. So in the time I have to talk to you, I can kind of sketch this and give you some uh, sort of pointers to learning more about it. Okay, and the goal is to build this kind of a bridge. Okay, so um, this is the goal of my group, is to uh, perform, get computer programs to perform situation recognition without any kind of exhaustive or brute force approaches. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a while. And to do that by incorporating conceptual knowledge, something these deep neural networks don't have, um, allowing the perception of context, and integrating both feedforward and feedback modes of processing. So those are three key uh, ideas. Um, and our initial task is to recognize particular situations. If I give the program a picture, I want it to tell me, is it an example of a known situation, like dog walking? And if so, how good an example, how good an instance it is. Okay, so how would we characterize the, the situation of, say, dog walking? Well, here's a really simple semantic network, or ontology, if you like, of this situation. Okay, there's a person who holds a leash, there's a dog that's attached to the leash, and they're both walking. Um, <laughs> this kind of falls apart. This is obviously a dog walking situation. You know, somebody labeled this dog walker. Um, but there's not, a, so there's not just one dog. There's a group of dogs. And there's also some other stuff, like this uh, stroller, which really isn't part of the dog walking part of this situation. So we have to figure out how to, say, group the dogs to say, what plays the role of the dog here? Well, it's a group of dogs. And ignore things that aren't relevant. Here's another example that fails under my ontology. The people aren't walking, they're running. Well, humans are really good at being flexible about this kind of uh, thing, saying, okay, well, they're running. Running's f similar to walking. This is, this, is a good, this is a dog walking situation, a little bit stretched from the uh, prototypical concept. Okay, so we call that, um, conceptual slippage. So saying that walking is part of a semantic space in which running is, can be kind of an analogous or um, equivalent concept. And similarly, we can group objects like dogs into groups 
that play the role of the thing that is being walked, okay? So that's, this conceptual slippage is, in general, is what really allows people to be very flexible, and computers that can't do conceptual slippage are very rigid about their concepts. So that's one of the problems in, in recognition, in vision, in language, in any field, that we really, to get to human level, you have to incorporate this notion of uh, flexibility or uh, what Doug Hofstetter, my um, former PhD advisor, called conceptual fluidity. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a very unhappy cat. <laughs> so is this a dog walking situation? Well, no, it's not, but it's certainly analogous. We could say what plays the role of the dog here, well, it's this cat, okay? So people might group this in the same general conceptual realm. Um, here's a nice, <laughs> um, this is really a night convenient because um, this animal comes with its own leash, okay? Um, so we, you know, start having to make more and more conceptual slippages. Here's a weird uh, contraption that you can attach to your bike. Okay, this is dog walking, okay, well, this person's not walking, she's riding a bike, okay, and these are kind of weird leashes, but we'll accept that. You know, here's another weird one. Okay, this is called dog walk, walking dog, okay, so people are really flexible about this, right, walking dog, um, but here we have, um, nobody's walking, actually. Um, okay, you know, we see things like this, if you're from California, you might see things like this, um, or even, you know. Uh, it, and, you know, everybody thinks this is hilarious. <laughs> and this kind of shows that, that, you know, a lot of humor is uh, grounded in sort of weird analogies, <laughs> or now, you know, kind of strange analogies. And, and it's funny, but yet it's dog walking. We, we accept all of these, we as humans accept all of these as dog walking situations. But I'm showing all of these to you just to show how kind of stretched the concept can still be and we recognize it. And it kind of shows you the challenge that's faced by artificial intelligence to try and get computers to be as flex to be able to recognize the situation and be as flexible as people. And, you know, when, how many people here know about Ray Kurzweil and the singularity? Probably, yeah, most people. Um, the idea that we're going to have human level intelligence in, I forgot what his date was, 2029 or something. Um, we're still, as it turns out, pretty far away. For, I, I don't know if we will or not by 2029. I tend to think no. But um, I think a lot of people who talk about, you know, where artificial intelligence is going and how dangerous it is and all of that ha ha have overestimated where we are um, in terms of what computers can do. They can't even recognize dog walking, you know? So how much of a threat could they be? Um, so conceptual slippage is kind of the, the heart of the matter. And to approach this, um, Doug Hofstadter, probably many of you have heard of Doug Hofstadter. He wrote this book, Gödel Escherbach, which if you haven't read, you, you should. Um, everybody sh should try and read that book, it's great. It got me into computer science. It probably got you into computer science as well if you're of a certain age. Um, so he developed this architecture that was the basis for a number of uh, programs that could make analogies. So uh, Copycat was my PhD dissertation. I'll show you a demo of it in, in, in a few minutes. Um, and some other programs, um, which were all summarized in this book, Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies, Computer Models of the Fundamental Mechanisms of Thought. And here's Hofstetter showing um, one of his um, pictures of, this is a picture of uh, the letter A in many different typefaces and shows how kind of fluid a is, you know, just the concept of an A, being able to recognize A in many different really crazy fonts. Okay, this book has, has a, um, a little nice piece of trivia associated with it. 
uh, which is, um, oh, and this is Doug Hofstetter in the Fluid Analogies Research Group. That was our, our research group at I Indiana University, first University of Michigan, then Indiana University. Um, it was the first book ever sold on Amazon. <laughs> and in fact, Amazon named one of their buildings after the customer who bought it, <laughs> which is really funny. Anyway, um, I also wrote a book, but nobody seemed to notice that. <laughs> but anyway, um, Copycat, which um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Copycat, then I'll talk about how the, we're extending these ideas to this visual situation recognition. Copycat was a program that I wrote in the, um, the 1980s um, in Common Lisp. So I you know, really like functional languages and everything. I was writing on uh, Sun workstations back in the day when Sun was around. Um, and Copycat made uh, analogies in a micro domain, OK? Back, back in these days, it was, it was OK for artificial intelligence to, be, to work in these so-called micro worlds. And in fact, that's what science usually does. They use micro worlds. They, they scale down phenomena to, to, to sort of their essence so that we can understand them. And so you know, th this can be a really useful. Um, I don't know if anybody will get this joke. <laughs> <laughs> this is Carl Sagan as a kid, right? Uh, does any, if you're, some of you are too young, but <laughs> if, look for somebody kind of older in the room and ask them to explain it to you. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, what we did was um, looked at mini situations made up of letter strings. So this is a situation. Think of it that way. It has objects, and it has relationships between the objects that are in some kind of sort of stereotypical way. A, B, C, it's a little sequence in the alphabet. And we say, well, what happens if you change that to A, B, D? What should be the analogous change to I, J, K? OK? Well, this is a, like a little situation, and it's like we're it's like I show, you, I, say, I show you a picture of somebody walking a dog, and I say, OK. And then I show you another picture of somebody walking like 10 dogs, and I say, if I change, you know, what plays the role of dog in this situation? Oops. And most people will say IJL, replace the rightmost letter by its successor. But you could have said IJD, replace the rightmost letter by a D. That's what we did up here. That's being kind of literal. Or you could say IJK, replace all C's by D's. There's no C's in here, so you do nothing. ABD, <laughs> replace any string by ABD. <laughs> Why not? So um, this is a this is a you know we would think of this as a very boneheaded thing to do. Um, <laughs> But you know, why do people prefer this kind of answer to this answer? There's no, you know, no overriding goal here. Well, one reason is that it takes into account the structure of this string, whereas uh, the other ones don't, the fact that there's successorship relationships. OK? So here's a, 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 another problem where ABC changes to ABD, what does IIJJKK change to? Well, if we do, if we're very literal, we can say we'll replace the rightmost letter by its successor, just like we did before. And that replaces it by an L. But the problem is that doesn't take into account the group structure, kind of like our group of dogs. And most people will say, well, there's a slippage here between letter and group. So I put letter in quotes because we're replacing a, we're not replacing a letter, we're replacing a letter, right? You know, the, the thing that corresponds to a letter. OK, another example would be this one, where we turn it around backwards. And here, you, you know, you don't want to say KJJ. That doesn't take into a, that just does the literal thing. But if we see them both as going as strings in the alphabet, this one's going forward, this one's going backward, we might say, well, the, what, the rightmost letter here is actually the leftmost letter. Or um, another way to think of it is um, instead of replacing the letter by its successor, replace it by its 
predecessor, which is playing the role of successor. So you get the idea that there's this, this little micro domain captures some of the issue of how do you make appropriate conceptual slippages. Okay, here's a final one. If ABC goes to ABD, what does XYZ change to? Okay, well, most people see that and say XYA, okay, because, you know, we know that the alphabet sometimes is used in a circle. Our program didn't know that, so we didn't allow it, so we said, no, okay, so you can't do that. What, what, can you, what would you do? So now there's a lot of this XYD is looking a little more, uh, <laughs> a little better, or even ABD. Um, but you might notice that these two strings have something in common where A is the first letter in the alphabet, kind of wedged up against a wall, and Z is the last letter in the alphabet. So you might make the mapping going this way and instead replace the, right, the leftmost letter by its predecessor, sort of going backwards. So we played with these analogies ad nauseum. This, is, this was, I spent, you know, four years in graduate school sort of writing down little letter strings. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite fun. And um, built a program, then built a pro finally sat down and wrote some code, um, and built a program that uses kind of a multi-agent approach, where each agent um, it's trying, has a hypothesis about, say, that the successorship is involved, or predecessorship is involved, or letter A is important, or grouping is important, and they all kind of get in there and fight it out. And um, I'm going to show you a little uh, demo of this working, just for fun. Um, so let's see if I can make this work on. Uh, this is a, a, a version of Copycat called Metacat that was actually written by Jim Marshall, because my, my version of Copycat doesn't run on, in this, on this machine, but this was written in Scheme. Um, let's do, do IIJJKK. Okay, and so what you're going to see uh, when I run this, I can't show you everything at once because the monitor is too small. Um, okay, I'm going to slow it down. What you're going to see is a bunch of these little agents trying out various things, like different possible relationships. Some of them fail, some of them succeed, and whether a relationship is dotted, dashed, or solid is how strong that relationship is perceived to be. And different relationships um, support each other. So if C is mapped to the, the, the leftmost, is, sorry, the rightmost is mapped to the rightmost, that supports mapping the leftmost to the leftmost. And what's going on is these agents are little pieces of code, that we call them codelets, that um, compete not for computation time. And the ones that get, there's feedback in that the ones that are supported, whose hypotheses are supported uh, by other structures, get more time. They have a higher probability of running. And um, that allows the system to uh, use feedback as percept things are perceived. So it's using context as, as uh, concepts are kind of instantiated to narrow down the search for a solution. So now it's got, it's, everything's very nice and, um, uh, oh, but it messed up. Uh, <laughs> this is a problem, see, the, the, pro the program is stochastic. There's a lot of probability in it and it can get different answers on different runs. And if it, see, it made this, all this really nice structure, but it somehow ended, it's, it's probabilistic when it stops and it ended before it actually um, made a link between C and the group of K, so it just changed the K to an L. Okay, well, so it, it, it's not as smart as people, that's for sure. Um, we'll try a different one. Uh, I'll just try one more to show you. Uh, uh, KJI, let's try that one. Uh, go and 
in, in, in the background here, let's see, is uh, a network, you won't be able to see this very well, but a network of concepts that have different activations. You can see all the letters. These are like the platonic concept of the letter A. And the circle is the activation um, percentage. And activated concepts have a more of an influence on what's going on here in the workspace, as we call it. Um, and there's also, as things get perceived, that activates the concepts. And there's one more little structure I want to show you, um, which I can't find right now. OK, here it got KJJ. It's just doing very poorly on this demo. <laughs> oh, well. Um, I've lost it, but there is a temperature. It's a little thermometer. I don't know where it went, but it, it measures sort of how well the program thinks it's doing as it goes along. Um, and I guess I must have closed it by accident, but it doesn't matter. I want to show you the program doing something well. So um, <laughs> I'm about to run out of time on showing you this, but um, let's just try ABC goes to ABD. What does XYZ go to? Um, and we'll speed it up. And um, what you'll see is it's going to try to take the successor of Z. And um, it's going to fail because Z has no successor. Let's see if it does anything here. Um, Oh, it went really fast, but it tried to do that. There, you saw a little X appear here. It said it was trying to take the successor of Z, and it didn't work. So that makes the temperature go way up. When the temperature is high, things are more random. And so structures are going to get broken. Other structures are going to get tried out. Um, we'll leave this for now and come back to it. Well, let's see if it actually gets an answer sometime. Um, so it keeps trying to take the successor of Z. Um, Metacat, which is this program, was a, a, an extension of Copycat that actually reasons about its own reasoning. That's why it's called Metacat. Um, and it's supposed to reason about the fact that it has it, that, that, it's, that Z is the problem, and figure out that, oh. <laughs> OK, well. <laughs> All right, well, you, you all understand that demos never, never go very well. <laughs> oh, here's the temperature. OK, well, it was hiding. All right, well, let me just, because um, I'm about to run out of time. Um, OK, go back to this. So this got me my PhD, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and uh, here's a little picture of me from 1990 with um, Doug Hofstadter, my advisor, and John Holland, my co-advisor. You may know John Holland was the founder of the field of genetic algorithms. This was at University of Michigan. So that was a very exciting day for me. I look very happy. That was like the happiest I ever looked in my whole life. Um, <laughs> but now, many years later, after doing lots of different things, I've kind of come back to this to uh, apply some of these ideas to the problem of visual recognition, as I was talking about. And we, we're, we're develop my group is developing a program called Situate, which is supposed to do with situation recognition, integrating these deep network ideas with this copycat-like ar architecture for analogy making. Okay, And I don't have time to tell you in great detail how it works, but I'll, um, uh, I'll try and sketch it. How much time do I have? Like. OK, well, I'll go for another few minutes. The idea is that um, we have a concept network, which gives our prior knowledge about, say, a situation. We don't learn that. That's like a future work to try and learn that, learn about situation concepts. We're, not, we're giving it the situation concepts. But we're saying, apply these flexibly uh, according to the situation. These are supposed to be these little codelets, these perceptual agents that each have a hypothesis and do this kind of fighting it out, and a temperature which measures 
how well the system thinks it's doing and this workspace. So that's kind of the architecture. Uh, concept network knows about people, dogs, leashes. Uh, it knows all kinds of different um, possible um, sort of semantic associations. I can tell you more about that later. And so the concept network interacts with this workspace and with the deep network that is co uh, computing low-level image features. And they all feed back to one another. That's kind of the idea. Um, and if an object is recognized, that constrains the program because it has some learned knowledge about where uh, associated objects might be. So if you know where a person is, that constrains, if you know, if you think, if I ask you, is this a dog walking image? That gives you some expectation of where you might look for the dog. And so that makes it more, um, why is this not going forward? Oh yeah, recognize components feedback to influence activations of concepts and create context for subsequent recognition. So it gives you some expectations. The temperature, as I mentioned, um, a con uh, controls the randomness with which these perceptual agents, these codelets, um, perform their actions. If the temperature is high, which reflects the fact that the computer, the program doesn't have much understanding, it hasn't built many structure, relationship or object structures, that causes actions to be taken more randomly because there's little information. As more structures are built, the temperature gets lower, and that means that um, the program has more confidence in its decisions, and it, um, decisions are made more deterministically. And this is sort of a, um, this kind of uh, transition in perception from being very stochastic, um, uh, a little bit less focused, searching randomly, and transitioning to more deterministic, um, more focused and so on, uh, that's seen in, in human perception, in human recognition. Um, so we're in the process of building this program, and um, we can do things like look at what's called weak segmentation, where you try and take an image and figure out where are the objects, um, roughly. Um, and then we can use that as um, a, a probability, a way to get a probability distribution over the image for looking at different objects. These are called heat maps. And basically the codelets look for specific objects based on these heat maps. And the heat maps are updated as new objects are um, tentatively recognized. And so you might have many different codelets looking for dogs or sidewalks. And they get some kind of rating from our deep network that says how likely they are to be that kind of object. And um, as if their rating is high enough, the system will actually build a, a def definitive data structure, which could actually be broken later, but say, now I think this is a dog. And that makes it more likely to look for other things related to dogs in places where the program expects them to be from prior knowledge. And um, starts that constrains the search for people. So these are, this is all, the program actually do, does some of this now, but a lot of this is still kind of vaporware, I guess you call it. <laughs> um, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not gonna tell you all the details, but um, essentially, let me just skip through this. So this is what this this is. Uh, so this isn't actually what the program does. It it it. it um, but it, we're hoping that it would be able to group objects, and um, map its structures that it built to prototypical situations that are encoded in the network, performing slippages as needed. So like a dog slipping to a dog group. And if the resulting temperature is low enough, it would say, yes, I would classify this scene as positive. Yes, it is a dog walking example. And the temperature tells you how kind of good it is or stretched it is, how close it is to a prototype. 
okay? Um, and if this, the, if, if it's, this doesn't work out, if the, the map matching between the structures built and the situation in the concept network isn't strong enough after several times, after enough times, um, the system will stop with a negative classification. Okay, so this, is, this just shows how all of this is very similar to things in neuroscience and cognitive science. And I'll end, so that's kind of what we're hoping to do. And um, I, I think it's um, the analogy making, in some sense, is really a key to this kind of human level recognition of more abstract situations and vision, I, in vision and beyond. Uh, this is my gr uh, group, um, former and current students, and my collaborator, Garrett Kenyon. Um, we're supported by the National Science Foundation, and maybe, um, I don't know how often this conference happens in Portland, but if you come back in two years, I'll be able to show you a working program. <laughs> this. Okay, thanks, and I'm happy to answer questions. questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, so do you, um, uh, when you think you identify some kind of job or you think identity, you identify some pattern, is there a sense of uh, some sense of certainty or probability with that to which you can kind of do multiple, multiple um, uh, partial beliefs and kind of let, let other, other things that you start to learn affect which of those might be more, more probable? Ex yes. So, so the question is, you know, is there some confidence associated with uh, a, a object recognition like a dog? And yes. So our system has a way of computing confidence by as, as the, uh, the object recognition network will give a confidence for its recognition, and also our system can incorporate that with confidence. Like if there's a person here and it thinks there's a dog here, I mean, it has certain confidence that there's a person here and it has certain confidence that there's a dog here, it can combine its, the confidences via what, what we, what's called a, a belief network to um, so that, that uh, the system can reason about other, where other, you know, it can update its whole probabilistic model of where things are likely to be. So, so we're using, techniques from what's called graphical models to do this kind of belief updating. Other question? Yes? Uh, so, not knowing very much about any of this, but is it, looking at what you're doing, is it possible to um, uh, play it backwards almost and have the computer generate a dog walking situation as a piece of art? Ah, that's a really good question. Uh, so could the computer play it backward and generate like a beautiful artwork of a dog walking situation. And that, that's something that, so in um, machine learning, people talk about so-called generative models, which can generate examples by sampling from probability distributions. And in fact, I think our, this is something that our system could possibly do. And that, that would be a very interesting uh, thing to try. Uh, I like that idea. Uh, yeah. So have we looked at like video, for example, or multiple objects or movement, multiple objects in a row? Uh, my group here hasn't been doing that, but my collaborator, Garrett Kenyon at Los Alamos, has looked at sort of object recognition in video, and it actually helps quite a lot, as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is your work currently open source, or do you intend to make it open source? Is, is it open source? Yes. Uh, so any part that we finish and feel confident that it sort of works, <laughs> it's open source and we will make everything open source, including all of our dog walking images <laughs> and all our code. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Or is that just kind of incidental uh, linguistic? 
Um, so by prior knowledge, I mean just knowledge that the system has previously learned or has been programmed into it before it starts running. That's all I mean by prior knowledge. A prior in Bayesian statistics is a probability distribution over something. So, you know, you, you, a, prior, a Bayesian prior might be incorporated into our prior knowledge. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely we do use these, this notion of Bayesian priors because because we're using Bayesian belief networks. Yeah, is there in the back there? It's hard for me to see you. Um, by correct, do you, you mean? Um, so, so we have a, con a, a network of concepts. We do, don't do any verification as to whether that network is correct. That's been given to the program. Then the program construct, constructs its own network in the workspace, which is trying to map the concept network into the workspace and say, how do these concepts apply here? And we are able, so the program will take what's been built in the workspace and compare it to the, to the um, permanent concept network and say, you know, how well does it match? And that's how it asks, like, is this a correct, you know, instance of this situation? The concept network is, it, its topology is not in flux. It, its activations change depending on what the program is seeing at the given time. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, so he asked, um, with our concept network, is there any um, compatibility with the work of Doug uh, Lennett, who's been trying to build networks of common sense knowledge? I th there probably is. I don't know a lot about what about that work. I think, you know, that's much larger scale than what we're trying to do in, right now. And he's trying to, I think, I don't know how much learning his group is using, but yeah, I mean, I assume that there, there could be. There's also a lot of work um, at Google in trying to build these very large ontologies for understanding, you know, documents and so on that might be compatible. Yeah, so eventually, so right now we're just trying to test out the general ideas, but eventually if this was ever going to be applied more broadly, we'd have to figure out ways of getting these so-called networks, semantic networks or ontologies. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, I, I, we see kind of complicated dynamics, I guess. I'm not sure how to characterize it, and I haven't compared it with like any human learning dynamics. But that, that would be an interesting way to go. But definitely, it ha what's, what's interesting about, I think one of the things that's different about this work is that uh, the, the process of recognition actually has dynamics, as opposed to the, the people who are just looking at these feed-forward networks, which really have no dynamics. It's just total feed-forward, right? There's no feedback at all. Okay, uh, yes? Uh, so in your system, it looks like you've got uh, each network picking out objects, and then uh, the new system that you're building is doing the situations. So do you think that there's potential for other kinds of analogy problems to use 
this system that you're building that's meant for visual problems, but have other problems that could be mapped onto like an abstract space and use the same system? Yeah, so the question was, um, could, could this be generalized to other modalities than vision? Um, and I think the answer is yes. I, I don't think there's that our um, mechanisms are specific to vision. I think they're more general. And so I, you know, I would love to see, and in fact, for copycat, people have actually applied it to like natural language and some other non-visual domains. Um, so I'd love to see that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yes. Sorry, just uh, to continue. What's the um, language is situate being situate being written? What language is situate being written in? So um, there's a few different uh, languages, uh, and we're sort of prototyping things right now. So um, we're pro uh, some of it's written in Python, and s some of the visual, the 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 very uh, kind of um, core visual routines are written in C for speed. Um, and some of the stuff we're using is being prototyped in MATLAB. I would love to see uh, a Lisp-like language applied to it, because that was like my first, my first programming was in Lisp. And uh, uh, your first programming is like your native language, right? You never, it's hard to beat it, <laughs> you love it. Um, but right now, you know, I'm like the, um, the big manager and all my students are doing the programming in Python and so on. So, yeah. Are you using graph database photographers or other media? Um, we're not using anything right now for a, a database. We have uh, data sets of images that aren't really, I mean, they're, they have, they're labeled. So the prior knowledge can be loaded from hard disk and just disappear in memory? Right now it's, very, it's you know, fairly small networks that we're talking about. So we haven't gotten to the stage of, of trying to scale it up. Yes. Uh, so as these systems see more of the world, uh, does their does the processing power uh, needed increase as they like learn more, adapt more to these protocols? So will the processing power needed increase? Probably. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is have something, uh, an architecture that scales, that scales well. That is that, um, uh, unlike. So the work in object recognition where the reason it's gotten so much better is that you can now throw, you know, billions of training examples at it. I don't think that's what humans do. And so one of the philosophies is to try and build mechanisms that really won't need that because of the ability to perceive context and be constrained by context that they won't, you won't need billions of training examples and you won't need to try and apply all of your different categories with equal probability as hypotheses. So the goal is to not have to scale, to, to have it scale in a bad way. But we'll see. Yeah. Yes? In that same vein, um, would it help to greatly ramify your concept network such that you're now recognizing concrete and helices and all these new that help you construct, you know, work up to these high level concepts and not rely so much on the deep network in its sort of, you know, difficulty in guessing where there's a bunch of dogs or a dog shaped, you know, fire hydrant. Right. So um, the, the question was would it be useful to sort of recognize more things at the level of the concept network, like, you know, small pieces of like a dog paw or a dog ear or something? I, I don't know, actually, because, you know, the deep networks in some sense are learning features, and it may be that those are the features they're learning. It's a little bit hard to open the hood, look under the hood of what they're learning. But if you could do that, it may be that that's precisely the kind of thing that they're learning to recognize. So I, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but it's a good question. Yeah. So is detecting images as poor as first take? Um, does it, what, how would you characterize it? Because you are covering a large search and right. You're also doing um, belief propagation, so it's not a kind of a simple yeah. process. It's very dynamic. I don't think it has it has a name. So um, Hofstadter called it a parallel terraced scan, which is kind of a weird name. But the idea is that 
You're exploring many different possibilities in parallel, or potentially in parallel, with these agents. They could run in parallel, for example. But not everyone is exploring at the same rate. The ones that seem more promising get more processing time. And, but that changes dynamically as more information is gained. So he called that a parallel terra scan. Uh, there's probably a better name for it, but I don't know what it is. Yeah? So they communicate via the structures that they build in the workspace. That's, so it's kind of like a common blackboard system, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd love to be able to predict if something's going to be funny or not. Um. <laughs> and I know people, people have theories of humor, but um, I'll, I'll just say that's not the goal of this particular project, but <laughs> it's a potential NSF proposal maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so if you could um, recognize what situation an image was, that would be great, because if you could finally organize all the photos on your phone, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the main application, right? Uh, <laughs> please give me all the pictures of birthday parties. Um, uh, what's the next hard problem? Um, Wow. Uh, well, there's a lot, you know, I guess uh, there, I'm not, I don't, there's a lot of hard problems. I mean, you know, being able to, I mean, that's kind of an open-ended thing, though, being able to recognize situations, because I might want to say, you know, give me all the sad situations, right? It's kind of a meta situation. Yeah, well, I mean, it's trying to build something that can do, something humans can do really well, but computers can't do really well. Um, and, that's kind of, and that's the why. And I think that there will always be things that humans can do well that computers can't do well. I mean, that's just my belief. But um, I think we're getting you know, closer. But that's, that's the reason we're doing it. Um, and I'm really interested in how, you know, how people do it too. So I think it maybe will give some insight into human cognition. And, you know, I think, well, that, that's a whole, uh, that's another subject. So I won't get into that. Okay, maybe one more question. Is that, does anybody have another question? Okay, uh, in the balcony. Oh, I didn't even know there was a balcony. Okay, yeah. So what will be the bottleneck? Uh, yeah, so, so there's a lot of bottlenecks, obviously, but um, learning concepts, learning what, what characterizes a particular situation. Also, you know, what we're doing now is, is much simpler than what humans do. I mean, what we're doing now is saying, is this a X kind of situation? But instead of that, what humans do is I give you a picture and I say, what's this a picture of? I don't even give you any hints. Right, and you tell me. So it's like you retrieve the kinds of situations that it could be. Um, how do you do that? I, I, you know, that's a sort of modeling memory, um, and that's that's a very hard thing. I don't I don't know how to do that. But you know, I think it has something to do with analogy making also. So how how our memories are stored as situations that are connected in analogical ways. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Okay, well, um, should we stop now? Th thank you very much. All right.